It's good to be here this morning. I want to welcome everyone. Welcome to those here. Welcome to those watching online. Um, it's going to be a good morning still. We still have plenty of time. We still have plenty of time. I have a special word in my heart, and I hope it's a blessing to you, to you as, it, as it really was a blessing to me when, uh, when um, I got to study the Scriptures and, and really got to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit in this. And, and if you want to follow along in your own Bible, you're more than welcome to. We're going to be spending some time in Exodus. We're going to be spending some time in Exodus 13 and 14. And it's quite a few Scriptures now. Don't worry. It will be on the screen as well because that's how we roll. But if you would like to follow along in your own Bible, you're more than willing, uh, welcome to. And I'm, I'm stalling a bit to give you an opportunity to page there. That's what I'm doing right now. But um, let's get into it. So we're, we're in Exodus 13, verse 18. We're going to skip verses here and there, but don't worry. I'll tell you where we are just because there's a lot. There's a lot we need to read this morning. So Exodus 13, verse 18. So God led the people around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Skipping to verse 21. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And by night, in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Exodus 14, verses from verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near pi Hohiroth. I'm so glad we didn't call William that. Um, between Migdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea, directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this, skipping to verse 10. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified. And cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there was not enough graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have we done? Sorry, what have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the, the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and Israel went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water on the right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horsemen and chariots and um, horsemen and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and the cloud at the Egyptians' army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, Let, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak, the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. Won't you help me out with my title this morning? 
I want to share a little bit. And if you say it off to me, you need the sea. Why don't you say that? Help me out. You need the sea. You need the sea. Lord, as we jump into this this morning, I pray, God, that you will just reveal your heart and your nature for us. Holy Spirit, we're ready to hear from you. We're ready for your encouragement and correction. We're ready to learn. In Jesus' name, amen. I absolutely love this story. It is a, it is a story full of uh, um, twist endings. Let me say that, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those movies that has like 10 endings and every time you think it's going to end, there's just something else happening. And it's a very exciting story, actually. I mean, it's one that's often quoted and often preached, but, but I think so often we tend to misdefine our circumstances. And hear what I'm saying. I, I misdefine what we're actually facing. See, we, we think we have an interpretation of, of what we're experiencing. And we think we have the full picture. So we truly think when we draw conclusions in our circumstances, they are the right conclusions. And the reason I'm saying this is because, well, this is what the Israelites did. I mean, they drew a couple of conclusions at a couple of places that were completely wrong. Just completely, completely wrong. But the reality is sometimes, well, okay, most times things aren't really what they seem. Things aren't really what they seem. And the problem is we draw conclusions on lacking information. And I want to show you something. And I hope you're ready for this. When, when we first became parents, um, good friends of ours, Pastor Ryan, as many of you will know, they gave us a whole um, medical box full of things. And in this box was this. Now, I thought, oh, cool. Uh, it's, it's to clean your fish tank. You guys know that? Those fish tank things that you clean the gravel with? Yeah. But I was like, no, that's not going to work. That's a bit small. And um, I was like, okay, 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 okay. Maybe it's to measure medicine. Because that's plausible, right? You, know, that you can measure an amount of medicine. And to my horror, I realized that this fresh piece of hell is to suck out snot out of your children's nose. Parents say amen. No, no, listen, no, they say, listen, it's safe. We'll give you this little piece of sponge to protect you. I have never felt more unsafe in my entire life. This is not safe. I drew the wrong conclusion about what this thing is, and I, I wish I never found out. It's better. Some people don't even use it, but I'm not going to go, not going to go into that. They, they just use their mouths, man. They just go. <laughs> oh, Jesus, sanctify me. Oh, we have lost control. But like in the case with this torture contraption, we sometimes wrongly assess things. Is that okay? Is that okay to admit that, that every now and then you drew a conclusion and then you later realize, oops, you drew a conclusion about someone. And then later you realize, oh, they actually meant really well. They were actually really loving me when they were being honest. They actually had the guts to say something. We, we, we tend to draw the wrong conclusions. And now, this is an incredible story about the Israelites. I mean, they had more information than I've ever been privileged to. Because read it again. It, it before, long before they get to the sea, which they thought was their demise, they were promised, listen, this is what I'm going to do. God was speaking to them, saying, this is what we're going to do. All right, guys, huddle in. I want to give you the plan so that none of you are caught off guard. We're going to go around again so that they think something that's not true because we want to draw confusion from them. And then God said, what I'm going to do, what you can't, is I'm going to confuse them even more, so much so that they ran back into the sea. By the way, if you read it, they didn't run from it. They ran into it before they were all killed. And so they came out with this information. And, and one of the biggest things of information is that God said, I will be glorified. I will be glorified. But at the first obstacle, they forget. They forget. 
They forget the promise. They forget the purpose. They forget everything that God has said because at the first obstacle, and we see that in verse 11 and 12, at the first point of opposition, they go haywire. Absolutely haywire. Now, now whether you like it or not, your perspective will influence if your obstacles will derail you. Not the obstacles themselves. Whether you like it or not, the situations you face do not have the power to derail you. It was your perspective in it that did. It was your perspective in it that did. Because this is what we see here, is their perspective shaped their perseverance. But because they lost perspective, they were like, it would have been better for us to die. That was their first response, and that is how they were influenced in this life. So, let's get into today. I want to give away my sermon quickly for you guys, because I know some people are like, oh, you said cupcakes, and that's really, that's all we see now, man. Like, <laughs> great, yo, I need to see. Okay, yeah, we need to go to the beach. We need a holiday. We agree. Amen. Pre preach it, pastor, and you want to go. So, I want to give it away so that we are, there's no misconception here. Is your C, your obstacle, an obstacle or an opportunity? Do you see your things in life as an obstacle or an opportunity? Because at the end of the day, God uses what we perceive as negative spaces for positive influence. God uses what we perceive as the end, as the very thing to rescue us. It's all about perspective. See, what happens when we face resistance is it forces response. You cannot face resistance in life or obstacles in life without responding. And the beautiful thing is response reveals your disposition, your where you're at, your faith. I mean, Beginning of last year, you guys will remember this faith over fear. Everyone remember that? You know, it was everywhere. We also plastered it everywhere because it's true. And yet, so often, at the first point of an obstacle or resistance, I have been proven that fear is over faith in some areas in life. Or not in you guys? You guys didn't have a single doubt over the last two years? When payroll didn't add up and salaries had to be paid? When bulls were outstanding, you guys are better Christians than I am, man. Gee whiz. But see, in our positions of opposition, we are forced to respond. And that is a good place to be because it forces us to change. See, the Israelites, in that moment, they were forced to respond. They were met with the sea. They looked up, and here comes the army to get them. They were met with that, that difficult time, and they had to come to grips with their situation, and they responded by forgetting God. Now, now uh, I don't want to bash on the Israelites, but they literally had a cloud in front of them. I mean, <laughs> I, I wish sometimes I had a literal cloud in front of me, Right? It's like when difficulty comes, you're like, but wait a second, there's a cloud. Oh, we're fine, guys. <laughs> we're okay. We're not going to forget the promises of God. And yet, what they did is they forgot the promise and they turned on their leader. It's going to get quiet in this church for a moment. Is it okay? In that moment of opposition, they turn on Moses. How often do we not turn on our leaders because of situations? The Bible instructs us not to judge our leaders, but to, oh, you sanctified souls. I love it. To pray for them. Moment of silence for all those leaders. <laughs> oh, man. Something was shown in their hearts that wasn't towards God. It wasn't. But it's in those difficult spaces, those, those moments that we're forced to respond it's those times that God can use to change something serious in us. It's those times where we maybe become aware of shortcomings in our own lives that we all of a sudden get to work on. If we're willing to. 
And I have to say, if we're willing to, because it is in difficult times that we become vulnerable, we become susceptible, we become sometimes even willing to change. Unless we think we know all the answers. Unless we're so clever that Jesus sometimes consults us on what to do. You know? He sometimes comes and says, Hi, I've got this issue. <laughs> I'm joking, he really doesn't. <laughs> he really doesn't. If you rely on your own wisdom in times of opposition, you will fall. Here comes a pastoral warning. You're just not smart enough. I thought that would get an amen, but I, I guess <laughs> I set myself up for failure there. You're not smart enough. Turn to your neighbor and say, you know nothing. Okay. Husbands and wives didn't do that. I love that. Not a, sing <laughs> not a single husband turned to his wife and said, yeah. Oh. The wife got a bit of a twinkle. You've been waiting for that moment, haven't you? I'm joking. I'm joking. Oh, man. The first response of the Israelites when they were blocked in by the sea was to say, hey, you should have left us alone. We know what was best for us. We would have rather been slaves. Huh? We know. I told you we knew, Moses. I told you. They knew nothing. They knew nothing. And if you are unwilling to accept you do not have the answers, you will not receive the blessing God has in store for you. Because if they relied on their own knowledge, they would have died in Egypt. This thing wants to make a comeback. Get out of my life. <laughs> if they relied on their own wisdom, they would have died in Egypt. The Bible says, gives us such a, a heartfelt and soft answer to this. I absolutely love it. Now, probably one of the most gracious things that Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 17, 9. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. It says, hey, don't trust your heart. Don't trust your heart. Because my heart thinks that I need at least three slices of cake a day. Mm, amen. That's not going to be good for me. But we have a world that says, no, just, just trust your heart. No, don't ever trust your heart. Don't trust your heart. You know, just, just do you. Do what's best for you. No, you don't know what's best for you. If you do what you think is best for you, you're going to die in Egypt and never experience God's true blessings for your life. Don't rob your life of God's blessing by putting yourself up as the authority over it. Ooh, are we getting harsh in here? I love you guys, man. I have to be honest. Thank you so much. <laughs> We think we want the easy road in life. We really do. You know what the easy road doesn't bring? It's character. You know what the easy road doesn't bring? It's real faith. I'm, I'm going to say it. Because sometimes faith needs to be tested. So here we sit at this, this very difficult space of having to assess whether we're going to follow our hearts or whether we're going to follow God. Whether we're going to respond by, by thinking what we know. Because, listen, more often than not, what you think you want is not what you need. What you think you want is not what's going to be good for you. This, this is just unfortunately the reality. And we will suffer in life if we only go on what we think we need rather than what God's heart is for us. So here comes the Israelites. And they seem to forget that God has led them. I mean, listen, they, they saw with their own eyes the Egyptian children dying and they're staying alive. They saw with their own eyes when the plagues came through and they were being delivered. They saw with their own eyes when, when they walked out of Egypt. They, they had a lot to go on, 
shall I say. They had the promises of God. And here they, they walk out and they don't just seem to forget what God has done, but they also forget that ultimately God said, this is going to be for my glory. Now, now this is very important for us. And, and today as well, this is very important. The sea is for God's glory. The sea is for God's glory. Your obstacles should ultimately be for God's glory. Imagine how different our lives would look if every time we faced opposition or obstacles in our lives, instead of responding with words I'm not mentioning from here, um, everyone's like, I don't, we don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, we, uh, we, we go straight to prayer every single time. <laughs> instead of responding in our flesh, what if we looked our storm, our sea in the eye and said, God's going to be glorified? What if the next time you faced an issue in your work with your boss and your family, you whisper, ooh, God's about to get the glory. No, I don't know the outcome of this situation yet. No, I don't have the cloud. I don't. But I know God is about to get some glory. Because he's going to get glory in my response and how I act in the situation. And he's going to get glory in the outcome. God's about to get some glory. I just lost my job, but God's about to be glorified. I'm struggling in my marriage, but God's about to get glorified. I'm struggling in my business, but God's about to get some glory. Because God is going to be glorified. I think a lot of things will look differently in our lives if we decided that obstacles is an opportunity for God to be glorified. In our troubles that we face, in, in these difficult times we face. Now, by the way, it's a lot of fun. In John 16, 33, there's this beautiful promise um, where Jesus says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Uh, I mean, that's not one of the greater promises. It's not usually one we write on our mirrors, you know, in the mornings you, to see every morning, oh, I will have trouble in this world. Is that anyone's, you know, verse of the day? Uh, it's usually just not, um, you know, it doesn't coincide with Jeremiah. 29 11. So usually we don't pick that one for our mirrors to read every morning. But this is the reality that in this world we will have trouble, but trouble is an opportunity for God to be glorified. It is. And that's what we see here when they got to the sea, God was going to get the glory. Because in that moment, not just did God make a way for them to go, but He created an opportunity for them to grow. That's what happened. Now, as a parent, we just dedicated my kid. As a parent, I know that the worst idea on earth is to give my kids everything they want. That's the worst idea. It's just not good. Daddy, I want ice cream for supper. No. <laughs> Me too, but no, okay? Because my heart is deceitful above all things, wicked beyond <laughs> repair. But see, in the same way, God allows and uses circumstances in our lives to instill in us what we need. Because the Israelites needed more faith. And in fact, that moment, that single day, that single day in their history changed their future. Because they reverted back to it. God is the God that saved us through the sea from the Egyptians. So, in the beginning of this, well, not beginning, about middle last year, I, uh, I was, uh, had this leadership conference thing online through GLS. It was really good. Um, and that I attended, and, and in this, uh, um, Craig Rochelle is, is probably one of the best leaders on earth. I'm gonna say it, um, and he does great things. And, and Craig Rochelle was teaching, and um, it was a bit strange because he was also sitting in like a room with just the microphone, and it was, it was strange times, really good. But in this, he said a statement that, um, that kind of offended me at first, just a little bit, 
And then it made me realize a couple of things because in this, he quoted Winston Churchill and said, never waste a good crisis. And I'm like, goodness me. <laughs> never waste a good crisis. Now, now, we were just in COVID. Winston Churchill said this during World War II. Okay, so that was even harsher back then. And now Craig Rochelle quotes him in saying this now. And at first, you know, it's like, okay, but I don't really know what to do this. But to quote Plato, going back even further, is necessity is the mother of all innovation. See, when we come to a point of having no more answers, we come to a point of having very open ears. Let me rather say, we should. We should. Because in our broken times, it's in our necessity times that we truly become open to God doing something. Because if failure has taught me anything, it's that I cannot rely on myself for success. I cannot. And it is in those times where we face the seas in our lives that God uses it as an opportunity to uplift us and to install something in us that we need for the next season. It is in those difficult times. Speaking on talents just the other week, I shared that so often we look at successful people and we use the excuse, yeah, but they just have more talents than we do, you know? We just think, oh, no, no, no. God really blessed them more than us. That's why they're a success and we're not. No, no, no. Those are excuses. Those people were faithful. Those people worked. And so often we come out of crisis like this and we look at other people and say, yeah, but how are they doing so well? God must have blessed them with more. No, they were more faithful. Is that okay? And so often in the obstacles, thanks. And so often in the obstacles we face, when we get shaken in our faith, we look around to see people that are doing well and we think, no, they just have more faith than me. No, they just ran to the safe space. So I want to ask you, your C, your obstacle, those big things in your life right now, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's financial. I don't know if it's relational. I don't know if you are lonely or too many people in your life. If you are poor or wealthy, that doesn't matter. We each face C's in our lives. Things that we think is going to be our demise, it's going to be the end. Things that God intends to lead us through and to build into our lives what we need. But I want to ask you, how are you dealing with the sea in front of you? How are you dealing with it? Where are you running? Where are you running? Are you like the Israelites that stood there and said, hey, I mean, we knew, man, you should have listened to us. We told you. Or are you still having faith in God's ability to split the ocean? Because listen, I said just now that we don't have the cloud and we might not. But we have something they don't, an account. This is our cloud, a truthful account of what happened. And if God was an ocean-splitting God back then, he's an ocean-splitting God today. He is. He really is. An interesting thing, though, and I'm almost done. Then we're going to have coffee and cupcakes, I promise. While God, <laughs> while God was splitting the ocean, the Israelites had to walk. The Israelites had to do the walking. And I want to encourage you today. If God is showing you a way through the sea you're standing in front, walk. Walk that sea. And that might be to worship for the first time in two years. That might be to worship. It might be to come back to church. It might be to start tithing for the first time. Whatever God is calling you to do in this situation you're in, start doing it. Because if they never walked, they would have died on the shore. <laughs> the sea that seemed to be their obstacle was actually the vehicle of their rescue. In my life, I've uh, on a couple of occasions realized that the difficult times in my past has set me up for the things of my future. I have often realized that if I did not have the lessons of failure and difficulty, I would have not been able to be set up 
especially not to become the lead pastor of this church in my 20s. Yeah, because leaders like what you were in your 20s, yes. <laughs> I was 29. And a lot of that is because God allowed me to walk when I face things. So it's very simple. It's very simple. You need to see. It will show you what is out of place in your life and what you need to work on. You need to see because it will glorify God. You need to see because it will give you opportunities to grow. And you need to see because it will create in your life a testimony that you will need tomorrow. So, there's two things we need to do. Next time, if you're standing in front of the sea, I think it's time to whisper, God's about to get glorified. Because that's a statement of faith. And we need to start seeing our, our opposition as opportunities because God is about to do something in our lives. Let me pray for you. Thank you, Lord, that, that we have this account of Exodus. Thank you, Lord, that, that we can see that you've made a way before and that you're the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And that we can know you will make a way again. So, Lord, this morning I pray that you will start stirring up in us the faith to look at our obstacles and to say, God is about to get some glory. I might not know how. I might not know how this is going to end. I might not know exactly what I should do, but God is about to get the glory. So I pray, Lord, that with every breath that's in our lungs, that we will cry out to you and give you glory. And that everything that we might face, that we would come to you and say, Lord, we're out of ideas. Holy Spirit, come and lead us. Because we need your leading in our families. We need your leading in our relationships. We need your leading in our businesses. We need your leading in our finances. Because we realize, Lord, that in ourselves we are lacking. We don't have the answers. But in you, we have opportunity to overcome. Because you have already overcome this world. So thank you, Lord, that, that we have a safe space in you, that we can rely on you and trust you. And thank you, Lord, that we will see seas parting. In Jesus' name.